Are you going to stop me, little man? Kit Carson is legendary for his uncanny judgment and courage under fire. But while working as a fur trapper, the man famous for keeping his cool challenges a dangerous villain to an incredible duel to the death. Are you looking for me? A split-second explosion of gunfire will settle Kit Carson's fate. Am I the one you're trying to shoot? By God, yes! And create the legend of the greatest mountain man of them all. frontiersmen of the fur trade era left as lasting a legacy as Kit Carson. Of all the great frontier characters, Boone, Crockett, Carson, Cody, Kit Carson was the most important, the most significant. While we know Kit Carson best as a guide and scout, before that, he got his start as a mountain man. Everybody knew Kit Carson. He was a man who knew what the mountains were about. You wanted to run with Kit Carson, you knew he'd have your back. He's almost the Forrest Gump of the American West. He's everywhere, he's doing everything. And like all legends, Kit Carson's origin story combines both fact and possible fiction to create a frontier hero. Carson's tale begins at age 16 when following the death of his father, he follows the Santa Fe Trail to New Mexico. You can imagine how exciting this must be for young Kit Carson, who's rubbing elbows with trappers and other frontiersmen. And once in Taos, young Carson seeks out an old friend of his late father, trapper Matthew Kincaid. You Lindsey Carson's boy? Yes, sir. Folks call me Kip. Because of the familial connection, he ends up taking Carson in, and Kincaid becomes something of a mentor to Carson. He begins to teach him valuable skills, skills that he'll need in the years ahead. Aim to be a trapper, do you? Cut me some stakes about three, four feet long and put a point on one end of them. Yes, sir. Well, if you're as good a shot as your paw was, we'll eat good this winter. He was the first person who really showed Carson the ropes in terms of the skills that he would need to survive in the mountains. Kincaid gives young Carson a crash course in mountain man living, including his first bison hunt. Take note out downwind of them critters. Buffalo don't see too well, so if they don't smell us, they won't run. Now that big one out there, that's yours. He's a long ways out, so adjust your point of aim. Let fly when you're ready. Mighty fine young kid, mighty fine indeed. <laughs> Come on, we got work to do. Put another charge in that rifle. And by the spring of 1827, Kincaid decides that Carson is ready to strike out on his own. Well, all right then, kid. 
you fell in with some good men. You mind what your captain tells you, and you'll do just fine. I appreciate what you've done for me. In no time, Carson's been a cook and teamster, learning mountain man life. But his first brush with real danger still lies ahead. One quiet morning, Carson faces the first mortal crisis of his budding mountain man career. He's not a rookie by this point. He's been across the Mojave twice. He's been up into California, but he's still a very young man. You all can grab some chow. I'll water the horses. Not expecting trouble, the brigade leader leaves Carson in charge of camp while others trap the nearby Gila River. Carson, even though one of the youngest members in the Trapping Brigade had assumed a leadership role, he had that kind of spirit, that kind of character. But the unexpected arrival of a Chemawavy war party puts Carson's small camp into instant danger. Nobody does anything rash. I'll try to parlay. There weren't many white men going into the Gila at that time, with the exception of a few prospectors. So there was still a level, a degree of animosity, because you might imagine they didn't see many intruders. Chema Wavy seem inclined towards a friendly encounter. But Carson soon discovers that the chief's peaceful stance is just a ruse. You didn't want to have a confrontation, but Kit could see that they were hiding their weapons under their blankets and that they were up to no good. Carson wants to avoid a bloody close quarters battle, and for the moment has the element of surprise on his side. Follow my lead, boys. Stay sharp and show no fear. The primary goal was not to reveal a sense of danger that you might feel for yourself and your men. He didn't want to kill a bunch of Indians. He didn't want his men killed. And so he did the best he could under the circumstances. Each of you is going to take a bead on a warrior. But don't shoot unless I say so. No somos muchos hombres. Si morimo, el precio será grande. Muy grande. Por he was ready to fight, and he communicated very clearly that if you attack us, there will be a high price to pay for it. You have five minutes to live. Carson's fearless stance takes the warriors by surprise. His boldness, beyond anything else, is an indication to the natives that he was no pushover. Kind of like in the old westerns, you know, you may get me, but I'm gonna get you. And you know, which six of you wanna die right now? Young Carson's bravado has evened the odds. But now, one false move by either side could lead to instant carnage. In a tense standoff against a band of hostile Chemawavy warriors, 
young Kit Carson is more than holding his own. This is one of the quintessential who will blink first scenarios. The Chemehueve could try to fight Carson and his men. The question is whether they're willing to sacrifice any of their own in order to do so. I think that there was a calculation going on with that chief. And I think he looked at that pugnacious young man and thought, somebody's going to die here. I don't want it to be me. So once it became apparent to them that there was going to be bloodshed if they didn't do as Carson ordered them to do and leave the camp, they left the camp. Shut your traps. Pack up the camp. We need to leave right now. Carson's no-nonsense heroics are a clear sign of things to come. This is an early example of Carson's fortitude and his willingness to take decisive action in the face of overwhelming odds. It was a real display of his leadership qualities. This was a young man who was going to be going places and doing things. Through the years, tales of Carson's courage and tenacity as a trapper and hunter spread across the frontier. He eventually finds himself back in the Rockies, working alongside another frontier hero, Jim Bridger. So old kid, he scrambles up that tree, two wolves right on his tail, and they're trying to climb the tree. And already, his exploits and adventures have made him a minor frontier big legend. Dogs. I mean, big dogs. Carson became a sort of mythic figure where he was 10 feet tall and bulletproof and almost superhuman in his capabilities. Big dogs, you know what I mean? Well, <laughs> part of that is true. If I'd have been for that tree, I'd have been a goner for sure. Hogwash. There ain't nothing in the whole Wild West that could kill old Kit Carson. <laughs> but he's actually pretty uncomfortable with the gap between how he perceived himself and how others perceived him. Well, that part ain't true. <laughs> This place, from like paradise, it ain't. It'll kill you, me, any of us. hundred different ways. Didn't mean nothing by it, kid. Just tails. Tails is fine. Get to tell the two parts, too. I would tell y'all about that time I found that petrified forest. There I was. As I come out of this clear, I see it. Dead in front of me. But whether he likes it or not, fate is about to put Kit Carson to an even greater test of bravery. Rocks. Trees, the shape of rocks. As Carson and Bridger camp down, they're visited by the most determined native opponents the mountain men ever faced, the Blackfeet. The reason that the Blackfoot and the Americans were always going head to head was that the Americans never asked, can we come and trap? They just started taking, and that didn't set well. The key to Blackfeet warfare involves depriving their enemy of a critical resource, horses. The Blackfeet were expert horse thieves. Horse theft was an honorable profession for a young warrior and a way of making your name. And in this case, the Blackfeet add insult to injury by making off with Bridger's most valuable horse. They picked us pretty clean. It's a rough turn about my racehorse, though. I was looking to make a splash at the rendezvous with that one. Well, we know they're smart enough to make tracks. Figure their days right away. Might as well move on. Ah, oh, Jim. 
We gotta go after them. We'll get them rascals one day, kid. Then we get even. Right now, we need those beaver plues more than we need them horses. It was probably the same band that we traded with down by the river a few days back. We don't go after them now. They'll be back for more. Maybe take a few scalps, too. For Carson, seeking retribution is a fact of life on the frontier. You can't allow people to come and take your property. You've got to protect it. That's just the law of the mountains. If you mess with us, we are going to make you pay for it. And Carson picked that up. It suited his nature. He was a, a very pugnacious and combative man. He was ready to fight. All right, take four good men. You find them, you offer parlay before a gunfight. All right. Owens, get your boys, let's go. Kit, I mean it. No need to shed blood over this. Carson agrees to forego violence if he can, but he's firmly convinced that retaliation isn't just necessary, it's unavoidable. Just what they did to us. We get our horses back without gunplay, fine. But we ain't going back without our horses. Owens, you're with me. like inevitable fighting breaks out. But Carson then recalls his promise to Jim Bridger. In an episode that becomes a minor legend of its own, Carson halts a battle in progress to ask for a parlay instead but he must now convince the hostile Blackfeet to return the stolen horses, or else fight to the death. Session! Trying to fulfill a promise to his friend, Jim Bridger, Kit Carson has just stopped a battle with the Blackfeet to try a parlay instead. Khan Otas Sasu Iskini Gistu Ispik Nina Ochgat Naduka Bonokami Dakes. Deception is part of warfare, always. And I think that the Blackfeet were definitely blowing smoke at Carson. He's trying to salvage the night's work by offering a pittance in response, but it's not going to work. Kit knows better. Okat, Okan, Otas. Sa, imat sa, tse, pana pi kwan, itawa nik, and I'm six of gates to be, sak kwe, kitane wu, boy napsi. And we shall fight. With both sides feeling deceived by the other, the fighting resumes with renewed intensity. Let's go, fellas! Taking a bullet to the shoulder, Carson's knocked out of a battle that's spiraling out of control. Carson, even by this early point, had the reputation of being almost invincible. But 
Carson is seriously hurt for the first time in his life. And there he is, bleeding out from a serious wound. Knowing this is a fight he can't win, Carson does the only thing he can, call for a retreat. Carson survives his close call with death, but what lesson he learns from the experience remains to be seen. There was a high price to pay for attempting to recover those horses. It's the first time Carson has to sit out the end of a battle, and it's a shock and disappointment to him. So you nearly got killed. Those Blackfeet are gonna come at us fighting, and you didn't get our horses back. That sum it up. Talking is always better than fighting. You're too quick with the trigger, kid. One day, that's gonna get you killed. But in just a few months' time, Carson's fighting spirit will face the greatest challenge of his amazing career. After the confrontation with the Blackfeet, Carson and Bridger travel to the Mountain Man Rendezvous, where trappers trade their pelts and stock up on supplies. The rendezvous is one of the most colorful activities to be found in Western history. You might think of it as a combination of a medieval fair and a business conference. And many of the native peoples also came to these rendezvous because it was the biggest party of the season. There ain't no way he was ever getting out of that hole. It must be 10 feet deep. I don't know where it came from. Carson's been to the rendezvous many years running, but this one is destined to be unlike any that came before. I think it's likely that having been wounded and very narrowly missing his mortality, that it was time to start thinking about having a family. And it's with marriage on his mind that Carson first lays eyes on a celebrated beauty of the mountains, an Arapaho woman called Wanibe. Many of the trappers took Indian wives. Many of these marriages were marriages of convenience. But this wasn't the case with Carson. He was looking for a love match. She is reported to have been very beautiful and of a lovely temperament. And it seems that Carson was pretty taken with her and she with him. Wanibe is a great catch, as folks would say in the mountains. But her father is an important leader of the Arapaho. She's a fine woman. But her par is an Arapaho chief, kid. Don't do anything foolish. Where are they trading silver at around here? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Come with me. Never thought I'd see Kit Carson shopping for lady trinkets. Neither did I. But even as Carson's mind is on marriage and family, serious trouble is brewing at the rendezvous. American! You what cheats me? Oh, you are like Chitin, sir. Yes, you are cowards and weaklings. 
A French-Canadian riverman named Joseph Chenard is a dangerous ruffian who's eager to fight, especially with Americans. That heavy set fella's been on a bender since he got here. Any wars yours? Yep. A great Captain Chenard came all the way down from Hudson's Bay. I bet Canada doesn't miss him much. He was known as the great bully of the mountains and apparently had earned the reputation. Chenard is boisterous and loud and obnoxious and big and had spent a considerable amount of time pushing the other mountain men around. He keeps it up. He's liable to get himself shot. Let's just find something fancy for your lady friend. While Carson usually wouldn't hesitate to put a rowdy thug in his place, instead, he faces an unnerving new challenge, courting a beautiful woman. So, hello, what's your name? You could not say it. Reckon I could try. Juan Nibbe. Juan Nibbe. Singing grass, is that it? Yes, I was born when the grass was high and the wind made music. Got this for you. On a bay. A hole. Not to talk to your father. He does not trust white men. You tell him Kit Carson would like to talk to him. I'm known to the Arapaho. You are the one they call Little Chief. Why did you not say? I asked your name on eBay. You didn't ask mine. Come then, Little Chief. But Carson's romantic interlude will be short-lived because the beautiful Wanibe has caught Chenard's eye as well. Oh. <laughs> dance with me, Julie Philly. <laughs> I say dance. No. No. Hey, get your hands off her. <laughs> You're going to stop me, little man. Go ahead. The next time I see you, run away like Petit Le Pun. <laughs> Although brawling is hardly unusual at the boisterous Trapper's Rendezvous, for Carson, the gauntlet's been thrown down, and he won't walk away from an insult to the woman he intends to marry. a violent altercation with a French-Canadian thug named Chenard. I am afraid of you! Frontier legend Kit Carson is torn between conflicting emotions of revenge and romance. Well, the whole camp's talking about your little scrap. Saying that Kit Carson's fighting French bears these days. Well, your shoulder seems okay. I intend to marry her, Chief's daughter. 
Only they were out the whole camp now, talk to her pa. About time you got woman. I done it. Never been happier. But Carson's confrontation with Chenard has caused collateral damage, including to his proposal to Wanibe. My father knows you've been fighting another man over me. I was protecting you. He does not want white men spilling blood over his daughter. And at that very moment, the man who ruined Carson's chance for marriage is sowing chaos and conflict at the rendezvous. Ugh. Back among his fellow voyageurs, Chenard's drunken bender is quickly spiraling into violence. What are you looking at, stupid? Hmm? Are you going to do something? Shinar was enough of a bully that I don't think he cared who he fought. Uh, he was making threats and actually physically attempting to assault people who were trying to stay out of his way. And Shinar's temper quickly focuses on the Americans he already despises. Oh, a petite American, I challenge you. Stand up! I let you get the first PTA, your best shot, and then I beat you, miss. But you don't want to fly. Look at me when I speak to you! All of these cowards, huh? They need red lights. You American, you're all like mewling schoolboys to me, eh? Huh? We are voyagers of the Hudson's Bay! We are men! The rivers, the mountains, we were all here long before you left the crater. I will cut a switch from this tree and beat you all into respecting us. Hey! Well, I'm an American. I'm not afraid of you. Ooh. Shut your mouth or I'll rip your guts out. This really is the only time in his biography that we see this level of anger, almost rage, in him. But the implication of Carson's words is clear, leave or fight. He's challenging him to a duel. Petite Lapine, my little bunny rabbit, you want to fight? Hmm? Me and you alone? Go get a gun. It wasn't a slap across the face with the glove that you might have seen in Europe or the American South. It wasn't formal, but everybody knew that they were going to have it out. Three beer. Alone, Matanon! Alone, Matanon! The challenge has been laid down and tacitly accepted. I think emotion got in the way, and you cannot rationalize emotion. And both those guys were so mad. They lost control. Kit. Kit. Distraught over losing Wanibe and enraged by Chenard's insults, Kit Carson has staked both his honor and his life on a duel to the death. Frontiersman Kit Carson has just had his hope of marriage dashed by a dangerous adversary. 
and may now face death as he settles the score. Every man has their limits of what they'll tolerate. And in that situation, Kit found his limit. You know who that is, don't you? That man is Kit Carson. I care not his name. He's not scared of you. He's not afraid of anything. As far as Chenard was concerned, Kit was a shrimp of a trapper with a mouth, an adversary to be put down, to be showed up like he had done with all the others thus far during that time. I will teach your friend a lesson. Unforgettable, huh? All right. You had your warning. Whatever comes next, that's on you. Worried that Carson's thirst for vengeance will get him killed, his friend Jim Bridger takes one more shot at changing his mind. Listen, Kit, we all know that Chenard is a filthy French rascal. But, look, they say that he's a dead eye shot. I'm back down now. I'll never show my face around here again. Carson was not an out of control rager. His anger was very cold and controlled. He was going to make this happen, and I don't think that he had a bit of fear about it. All right. Spectators flock to watch the showdown, including Wanibe, the Arapaho woman who sparked the conflict. There's witnesses all around. There's Indians, there's trappers, and amongst that uh, crowd are many of Carson's friends who recognize he's going up against this big, strong, and very violent man. Kid, this don't need to happen. I already told you, this can't be fixed. Carson's fellow trappers, his buddies, are thinking, what is he doing? Carson's going to get killed right here before our eyes. Let's go. Carson and Chouinard ride right up to each other and then just stop almost touching against each other. They didn't stand on pomp and circumstance, if you will. They each got a gun and blasted away at one another. Am I the one you're trying to shoot? By God, yes! They fire almost simultaneously. Carson recalls it being as though there was a single shot. Chenard's shot barely misses Carson. But Carson's aim is true, and Chenard is greatly wounded. Carson's pistol ball hit Chenard in his arm. That took the fight out of the Frenchman completely. Gennard, showing what a fraud he was, wept openly, begging Carson not to kill him. Don't kill me. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Carson, by the standards of the day, the code of the frontiersman, is well within his rights to finish the confrontation by killing Schwinnard. And what Carson does next creates one of the greatest legends of the frontier era. <laughs> Kit Carson has just fought a point blank duel with the villain who's been terrorizing the trapper's rendezvous. Please have mercy on me. And now Carson must decide if his adversary will live 
or die. <laughs> the world that the mountain men inhabited was stark and brutal, and Shinar definitely had earned getting killed. <laughs> so what happens next? It's a matter of some speculation. It's one of the great ambiguous moments in frontier history. We don't know what ultimately happens to Shinar. There are those who believe that Carson finished him off. Other historians completely reject that as being out of character for Kit Carson. And it attracts all kinds of romantic notions around it. Was he chivalrous and allowed him to live? Was he murderous and took his life? Was it out of pride or was it in the defense of the honor of a woman? Chenard was never again seen or heard from around Rendezvous. Kit dealt with it, solved the problem forever and for good, and that was enough. The duel was an important moment in Carson's life, and this enhances his reputation in the mountains incredibly and begins the sort of building blocks of his legend. Carson had humiliated the bully of the mountains and won the hand of Wanibe. It was a great love match, and she would bear Kit two children. What happened with Shunar and Carson, we don't know. We probably will never know, but it's sure fun to talk about. Carson achieved unprecedented fame in his lifetime, and it's a fame that he was deeply uncomfortable with. And what we have in this duel with Schwinnard is just one instance in the annals of the American West where it's left open to interpretation. And that's part of the power of the story. If we knew for certain how it ended, it's unlikely we'd still be talking about it today. The famous horseback duel with Schwinnard is just the beginning of the legend of Kit Carson. He would go on to establish himself as the foremost guide and Indian fighter in the American West. His legend grew so great that he became identified as the king of the mountain men. He was a heroic man and highly accomplished man in a time of profound change. And he deserves to be remembered for that. 